big room full of people that all want to see your face and hear all the amazing stuff um, that you have to say. However, I will tell you that um, in preparation for this meeting, I gave both myself and the Secretary of Cody um, lots of information I took directly from the website about the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee, so it's a little bit less writing for our secretary. <laughs> okay, very good. Hang tight for a second. Okay. Would you mind, uh, while Aquila is hopefully checking on the AP for us, calling us to order and asking for roll call? I can do it. Good afternoon, Cody. It is 3.06 p.m. and I'd like to call uh, this meeting to order. And we'll begin today with roll call. Daniel Alexander. Here. Thank you. Ashley Wells Ajinkia. Here. Thank you. John Barber. Here. Thank you. Logan Black. Hillary Brooks. Here. Thank you. Nancy Carter. George Childress. Here. Thank you. Hank Jenkins will be absent today. Dennis Landfather will be here momentarily. Karen Lowe. Here. Thank you. Aquila Maxwell is here and is working on an AB for me, so I will mark her as present. Uh, Christopher Maddie Matheson. Thank you, sir. Kanya Moll is absent today. Monica Shimanor. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Paul Robertson will also be absent today. Joel Simmons. Here. Thank you. Stacy Spangler. Here. Thank you. Jessica Villanueva. Here. Thank you. And Nancy Welch. Here. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, at this time I'd like to call for the approval of April's minutes. And in order to do so, I will make a motion. Keeping I'm in mind motions. Yes. I'll motion to accept the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, sir. I need a second. Just keeping in mind that you actually had to have attended the meeting in order to make that motion or second. So we have a second. I'll say Childers. Childers with a second. Thank you. Uh, is anyone opposed to adopting the minutes from April's meeting? Okay. Passes. All right, wonderful. At this point, we will pause momentarily. Um, I'm going to go look for Aquila and see if we can get this started. Otherwise, what? And there she is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And I apologize, we are not going to be this scattered, or at least if we are, we pretend not to be. Maybe nothing has changed since when I was on that council. <laughs> well, we are in a nomination period right now and looking for two additional members. That's a hard one. Well said. <laughs> I'm 
I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Let's do that. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not going to get it. Oh, I can get that. I'm not trying. I'm so sorry. Can you reach it? Would you like someone with a little more criticality? Um, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. Uh, no, I, I understand. Uh, so, what is it? Just be careful. I don't want to be responsible for doing more down ones. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, seriously.
sales uh, would double in places like Knoxville. And um, that means now, instead of one person in five needing mental health care, it's two people in five needs mental health care. And, and that is something that has not changed since COVID started to fall by the wayside. And so the reason being for it not going down is by COVID's decrease uh, 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 our percentages of population going down. It, it didn't go down because when mental illness onsets, right, it starts to change the hardwiring of the brain some in, in terms of how it sends and receives messages. And once that change happens, you can't so quickly unravel it. It's stuck. And, and the best analogy I can give you about how that hardwired in the brain changes is oil on a spaghetti on a stove and drain it and leave the spaghetti to sit in the strain. And you come back to it about an hour later and you try to pull the one and move them out, you can't. And so that's the sort of thing. Once the wiring started to change for folks, you can't so easily unravel. So uh, COVID did have an impact. It also messed things up in, in, in a, a big way for people who had a mental health condition before the pandemic, before COVID. Um, so if, if I had depression before COVID, it made uh, the symptoms of depression all a lot harder to treat after I had COVID, right? And so the usual treatments may no longer work, that sort of thing. So, so that's one one issue. The other is uh, for some folks who had pre-existing mental health condition and then they had COVID, it can also speed up the course of certain conditions uh, now post-COVID. And so like, some folks with like dementia, and they had COVID, and now instead of dementia being a 10 year course of illness, it then sped up afterwards. So, COVID did some nasty things, and um, it would, we're not just going to snap back. You know, uh, the mental health of our community is, is impacted uh, significantly moving forward. Signif significantly more people now needing mental health care and then seeking mental health care too, so that impacts <coughs> how many people can actually get in the door today, whether it's at McNabb Center or Cherokee or whether it's in the private sector. So um, it, it certainly has tightened up access in a big way because there are not enough mental health professionals around in any way. And now you've got more people seeking help, so that, that makes it a challenge. Uh, but those are some of the things I, I, I would want you to know uh, because it's not going to go away. It's, it's a lot harder now since uh, before the pandemic. But there there is a lot of good that, that's happened, all right? And so I would focus on, on that too. Uh, what's really positive is during the pandemic, the uh, public sector providers, McNabb, Shatter, Cherokee, Peninsula, they rose to the occasion and found a way to keep providing those services regardless of the, the pandemic. Their call volumes were answered by their staff internally and they picked up the pace of certain people and they found ways to serve people through like mental health mm -hmm. sort of Our call volumes increased and we added staff uh, in our um, peer recovery call center. We had to because more people were, were seeking support. Uh, we also know um, that uh, a, a lot of folks have, have run into some barriers trying to find help, and that's how we help people a lot in our community as our call center tries to navigate its way around to find a place for someone based on their situation. One of the things we started last year, and, and one I'm really, really proud about, and, and I don't think enough people know about is we started a new program and it's called the Treatment Access Bank, if you will, TAB, T-A-B, Treatment Access Bank. And uh, we 
received some grant funds from uh, the city's mental health uh, ARPA fund, and we received some grant funds from the Trinity Health Foundation. And so we've created this program that allows us to help people who are just poor and marginalized and can't access care that they need because they can't afford it. So if they're above 137% of federal poverty level and, and they're check to check and they can't afford, you know, a $50 go bag to go see a doctor. Well, we're going to make it happen using the grant funds so we can get them in the door to see someone. We can provide them counseling for 12 sessions, that sort of thing, before we figure out what else we do beyond that. So that's really exciting. We've got 35 people in the program right now and more uh, folks in, in the onboarding process. But, you know, what we've been able to commit to for the 35 individuals that we're surveying who are all poor, thank you, um, and who otherwise wouldn't have gotten help. They would have gotten a lot sicker and ended up in the emergency room at some point. But um, we've been able to commit the resources to provide about 400 uh, therapy sessions to those individuals at this point in time. And so it, it's really an, an incredible thing, and it's keeping those folks healthy and in the community and not having to rely on emergency room services, that sort of thing. So now I'm sure I did not take up all the time that Stephanie would want me to talk about, and I wanted to do that intentionally and, and try to see if there were any questions anyone might have that I could answer before I need to run to the next one. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Cook? This is Stephanie. Ben, I just wanted, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. I know I didn't give you a great deal of notice, um, and I used what you gave me or said I had years ago, which is my magazine, to talk you into this. And I appreciate that. And I wanted to wish you a happy anniversary from yesterday. I think you had a wedding anniversary. Um, and, but my final question, my real question is, with the um, creation of the 988 phone line, I believe that's a national number for help. Have, um, have you, as the Health Health Association of East Tennessee, seen a decrease in calls or is it just about the same while that's being picked on? Yeah, so um, just to try to fill in the blanks for folks, 988 is a national suicide prevention uh, call number. And so it's sort of a universal place to call. That way you don't have to go digging around and some 800 number going out there. The, those with the rest of the digits, so mm -hmm. that's worth that. So if you call 988, you're actually going to get the call center in Oak Ridge, and then they're going to patch through to the local crisis service provider. If their um, specialists are not able to de escalate the suicide process right uh, away. So um, that's how it grounds. Um, not more than ninety percent of all calls in Tennessee that originate to the nine eight eight number get answered in Tennessee, which is fantastic. Wow, that's up from like sixty percent before um, nine eight eight started. So that that's really impressive. Our call volumes really have not changed since nine eight eight, um, and that's okay because we're not our calls are not designed to, to serve the folks in the crisis, um, but we we. Do have from time to time folks that, that are in a crisis, and of course our team is able to help de escalate that situation as needed. What, what our call center does is different from other call centers is we take phone calls from people that are needing to know where do I receive mental health care, right? Yeah. And then we're asking them the question can we call them back? And so it's unscientific, but Folks, when they've reached out for the assistance, they're at their most fragile moment. They've just done the brightest thing in the world that they can ever do is reach out and say, hey, I need help if I don't know where to chart. Or, can you help me? But so we offer, can we call them back? And then we're going to build that relationship with that caller. And we are going to call back. And in fact, the clients we serve on average receive a follow-up contact a hundred times in the calendar year. And so that means our team is very much on the ball, uh, calling folks uh, every few days. They are emailing, they're texting.
state and they're providing the support they can so that that person feels like they're supportive and motivated to go to mental health or substance abuse treatment services in the community and they're their bona friend and lifeline between the next therapy session so um, our volumes have not gone up what has gone up because of COVID it is our
Okay. And uh, uh, Okay, my turn. Uh, we got some new folks in there. This is John. I'm John Barber. Um, so I haven't met everybody. So a little, just real quick. I think we should give me five minutes to do what I have to do. So uh, my background, a little bit with disability, is I'm an adult son with autism. And for about three years, I was the director of an organization here in Knoxville called Johnny and Friends that uh, serves families living with disabilities through lots of things like uh, retreats and getaways, things like that. Um, and now I'm a pastor in town. I've been a pastor for 20 years, but uh, I'm a pastor on staff at Cedar Springs Presbyterian. That's a pastor with adults there. So uh, that's kind of what I'm doing. And that impacts what I want to talk about today. Um, Misha helped helpfully uh, entitled this Entities That Help People With Disabilities, which is the most generic title anybody ever came up with, but it works. And so just really briefly, I just wanted to talk about how lots of different uh, entities or institutions in town can serve people with disabilities. And when I talk about uh, institutions, I'm talking about things like restaurants, stores, public transportation, parks, uh, government buildings, academics, nonprofits, and houses of worship. Um, and these institutions can serve people living with disabilities in an escalating process of respect and representation. And the, first, the sort of first level there is simply accommodation. So the first step, and this is the bare minimum, uh, can a person living with disability ex access the place? Can they get in the door? Can they shop? Can they eat? Can they use the restroom? Can they park their cars? Can they simply uh, access the service that the place provides? That's the bare minimum. The next step up um, is dignity. So beyond just accommodating, are people living with disabilities treated with dignity? Are they not just allowed or tolerated, but welcomed? Are there opportunities for employment? Uh, I'm not just talking about wheelchair ramps here. Um, if accommodation is the obligation and dignity is the opportunity <coughs> to go above and beyond that minimum. I always, I always think about Joel's story about the bathroom at Jaboni's uh, that he's told a couple of months ago about being able to access the bathroom in, in a restaurant here in town, but because of the way they had built the doors, he couldn't get back out. And so, was an accommodation there, technically, um, but that was where it stopped. Um, but for houses of worship in particular, which is where my sort of experience is focused, um, there are some unique challenges with this sort of escalating process, but there's also a unique opportunity. And what you'll hear from me is I'm going to ride churches pretty hard because that's where my experience has been. Um, the problem is that houses of worship are traditionally pretty bad at these things. Uh, maybe out of all of the, that whole list of institutions that I named, they might be the worst at them. Um, as a pastor in Knoxville, I can pick on churches because I, that's what I do. Um, and when I say houses of worship, I'm going across the board here. They're not just Christian churches, although that's where my experience is. It's across the board. But church buildings tend to be old. They aren't accommodating. Many churches in Knoxville have to retrofit their buildings to simply allow entry into the sanctuary. In some cases, the retrofit, which is done by volunteers, is wholly unsatisfying. I know churches in this town where the volunteers built ramps to allow wheelchair access, but the angles that the ramps are built at are impossible to climb. They're useless. <coughs> Parking lots are technically legal. There are accessible spaces, but the access from the parking lot to the building are not navigable. There are parking lots in downtown where, yes, there are accessible spaces, but the angle of the lot, because the hill it's on, it, there's no point. You just can't do it. Um, in many churches, the sanctuary is accessible, but other rooms are not. Old buildings where Sunday school classes are only accessible via narrow staircases. Um, of course, there are some realities that make things difficult. It's a lot harder to modify 100-year-old pews than it is to move some chairs. For example. The church that I work at now is 225 years old. 
that could create some problems, um, some real problems. But still, churches, which should be literally paved in the way for people to have access, have dramatically fallen behind. So accommodation, even the bare minimum, is a challenge. When we talk about dignity for people living with disability in churches, it includes things that go beyond simple accessibility. For example, I've been in dozens of churches in Knoxville, and I can probably count on one hand where I've seen a stage that's accessible. So when a person with a disability comes into a sanctuary and sees that he or she would never be able to would never be able to participate as part of an on-stage activity, that strips them of their dignity. Well, when seating is only in the rear of the room, uh, that strips people of their dignity. And so the opportunity exists to go beyond simple accommodation to dignity, and these opportunities exist. I spoke to a church a year ago that was beginning the process of renovating their children's ministry area, and I asked the children's director how they were planning for children with disabilities when they were factoring in this change. And she looked at me like I had three heads. They were spending six figures to renovate their children's area. They had the opportunity to do this, and it wasn't even a consideration. They weren't interested. So houses of worship, they're not always great at accommodation or dignity. But I've also seen in houses of worship another level beyond accommodation or dignity, and that's empowerment. And this isn't exclusive to just churches, nonprofits, other organizations can do this too. Um, if they take the opportunity. They can avail themselves of the immensely talented, loving, and giving population of people known as people living with disabilities. Beyond just tolerating, accommodating, or excluding people with disabilities, it's vital to remember that each of these people are unique individuals with distinct gifting, desires, and abilities. Sometimes churches make a half-hearted attempt at this. I remember hearing about a church in Nashville that bragged that they included their friends with Down syndrome as greeters on Sunday morning because they have such beautiful smiles. And I'm all for someone with Down syndrome being a greeter, if that's what they want to be. But I'm also for someone with Down syndrome serving in children's ministry or in the choir or whatever they want. Because we can empower people living with disabilities to use their individuality to benefit the whole institution. When we do, we see healthier individuals in a healthier institution. Pick on churches because that's where my heart is and because it's where I see the biggest opportunity for growth. Instead of feeling loved because of who they are, I've seen people with disabilities treated as problems or in some cases, tokens. So as you speak to your houses of worship, please encourage them to not only accommodate, but to empower individuals to use their giftedness to benefit the whole. I was sitting there when I was reading it, it's like entities that help people with yes. disabilities. Barber, I thought, both oh, haircuts are important. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. Right, thank you. Don't forget to state your last name first. This is new back Barber. That is so super impressive. That I would love for you to send me a copy of that. Sure. I would love that in the writing. Thank you so much. Sure. That was great. I did. I was just saying, we're sorry. Um, so what can we do to change? Change it. Barbara here. Uh, the best way is if you're a member of a church, is advocate like crazy. Talk to your church leadership. As part of my role at Johnny and Friends, we would train churches on how to do this. And more often than not, the change didn't come from like that big senior pastor who preaches on Sunday morning. It came from a loving church member who who wanted to see change. So like a buddy program in a church usually starts with one person you know, who cared about some of this. That's how those things happen. Um, usually, you're not gonna go in and convince a pastor to do a multi-million dollar building program to, to retrofit the building, but uh, you can volunteer to serve. Yeah, and that's how it changes. Like most things, it takes a long time. Yeah, sure. Sit in the chair. Again, yeah, I think too, uh, John. A lot of times, people without disabilities overthink stuff, and if they'll get people with disabilities involved, they can find out really not an expensive or difficult uh, issue to tackle on some things. Okay? Yeah. Totally. Any other? Any? Okay. 
Looks like we're moving on to committee reports. Bylaws did not meet this month, so move into membership. Uh, this is Sue back. I would like to start with an introduction of the new members, Ashley Wells at Jinkia and Hillary Brooks. And then they have met um, both myself and Stephanie, but if our other members today will go around it and briefly introduce yourself to them after they're finished, that would be appreciated. Ashley, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm relatively new to the Knox I've been here for a year next month. So I'm here from Minnesota. Um, I am from Florida originally. Um, I'm on a little bit of a work break right now um, for my mental health and just trying to explore different options, um, including getting involved in community a little bit more. Um, but previous to my work break, I worked in book publishing um, for the last six years. Um, and then for the last two, so I've just gone successful with publishing and worked in a nonprofit um, after doing that. Um, but I've been involved in lots of DEI initiatives. Um, and have done a lot of public speaking about mental health and mental illness. Um, I identify as a person with mental illness, so um, that's kind of hard. Um, and I'm also a member of Knox Hills Junior League. Um, I'm a co chair of the um, we call it Quick Action Committee, um, where we try to make um, <coughs> a quick impact on a particular organization with particular needs um, and do it, have it done in one day. So, um, yeah. Happy to be here. Hillary. Hi, I'm Hillary. Um, I was a high school bed teacher here in Knoxville for 11 years, and I decided it was time for a change um, almost a year ago, and now I work with Project Search, and I'm an employment specialist with Sertoma. So I'm working toward increasing employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities in Knoxville. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Short, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Let's start with Childress and then go around this way and introduce ourselves. <coughs> All right, uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, my name's George Childress. And uh, first and foremost, I'm, I'm an audio engineer now. Just graduated by last, last week, so I guess it's kind of important. <laughs> 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 Uh, so yeah, audio engineer, uh, work with Lowe's, uh, also a paraplegic and double amputee, so I kind of like see both sides of things, and then I uh, was a walk since I was 19, so kind of hold the going on there, but well, that's about it. My name's Joel Simmons, and I, uh, I'm pretty much the glue and fabric that holds this whole thing together. <laughs> I understand that. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Nancy Carter, and uh, I work at Spark, the nonprofit serving people with disabilities. Uh, my disability is retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, I'm walking around without my cane today, which oh, caused me a lot of problems, but I had a snake in my bathroom last night, so yes, you'll have to forgive me. I will just disjointed it today. But um, I work mainly at Spark. I uh, am certified in JAWS, that's screen reading software for people to use um, that cannot see the computer. I teach that, I do community outreach in the senior living centers that are low income, establishing computer labs and doing computer training. And um, I'm the AT specialist in our vision room at Spark. I lived in the East Tennessee area for 40 years. I was not born here. And I moved to Knoxville about a year ago for the transportation because in case I want to live, there was just no transportation. So I'm very thrilled to be here. Thank you uh, for letting me be here and be a part of this. I'm looking forward to a great future. Welcome. Hello. Hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, I've been with Cody for since 2018, I think, is when I started as a member. Is that correct? So, you know, um, I work part time for KCD, as you see, I have here, Knox Center for the Deaf, uh, of the Deaf. And um, I also work with Deaf Blind Services as a coordinator there, and I'm an ASL teacher 
So if you all want to learn American Sign Language from me, come on and join the group. I'll definitely invite you all. I want you all to come. Um, it is definitely great to be here, and it's a nice meet. It's nice to be able to meet here in person. So hi again, and thank you. What's her name? Is Monica. <laughs> Excuse me for the interpreter error, Monica. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Stephanie. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica. I'm the program director for Deaf and Blind Services with Vocational Rehabilitation. So I work for the state. Um, I cover statewide services, but I'm obviously located here in Knoxville. Um, and I've been a part of COVID two years? Two, two years. Two years? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was out for a little while. I just came back from maternity leave, so <laughs> time, time makes no sense anymore. So, <laughs> two years. I'm Nancy Welch. I'm the program manager of Volunteer Assisted Transportation, a program at Knox County CAC where we help people with disabilities with transportation. It's one on one transportation. With, for seniors and people with disabilities, our volunteers that volunteer their time to take people to wherever they need to go, whether it be medical, shopping, social, and we stay, those volunteers stay with that person when they take them to wherever they need to go. And I've been with the program at CAC for 13 years, and I've been here with Cody about two, maybe three. Hi, my name is Stacey Spangler. I'm the Disability Resource Coordinator at the American Job Center, and I administer the Ticket to Work program for people with disabilities that receive SSI or SSDI, Social Security. <laughs> I know, well, I said it first. <laughs> my name is Daniel Alexander. I work for the City of Knoxville Parks and Recreation Department. I've worked for the city for 10 years. And my job with the city is providing recreation leisure opportunities, um, primarily for adults with disabilities. Um, however, over the last couple of years, I've now included uh, a few programs that have kids. Um, everything from special Olympic training um, to just gotten into wheelchair basketball and also uh, power soccer, which we'll hear talk about a lot. It is. Um, the only sport specifically designed for persons in power wheelchairs. Um, so we're currently doing year-round programming, and um, we have two more weeks of our softball league. If anyone wants to come down and check that out, it's an inclusive <coughs> league that um, half the team has a disability, half the team is not, and we just play like any other regular adult league. That is at Caswell Ballpark. Caswell or Caswell? Caswell with a C. Cross street from the Ashley and Cole Dream. Games are at 6 and at 7. <laughs> Thursday nights. <laughs> 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 Hi, I'm Karen Lowe. I uh, have been on Cody almost two years now. Um, my day job is as HR coordinator with Google Industries Knoxville. I've uh, been the HR coordinator since 2012, been with the company for 14 and a half years. Um, and we cover Knox and surrounding 14 counties, and we focus on hiring people with disabilities, as well as doing job training and all sorts of other things. Um, so if you know anyone looking for work, let me know. But that's not what you can. I already know. John Barber. <laughs> did uh, what I said earlier. That's <laughs> true. Yes. Dennis Landfather. Uh, been at Cody for two years with them and disabled that uh, diagnosed early on, on with uh, OCD, anxiety, and uh, clinical depression. That was like when I was 29, I think. So, uh, been, been in the military, got my body. But, you know, uh, so, yeah, just, I, I enjoy this vibe. This, this is a great clinic. And I would like to add that this is your executive committee right here. We've got the chair, vice chair, and secretary all in a row. Uh, my name is Yost. You can call me Quinn if that's easier. We'll call my uh, I'm not McCody. Just here as a humble server. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're all here. <laughs> 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 
Simmons said, I'd like to add that Yost is not mule from Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> and I read why it runs. So I think it's bring more just. <laughs> Uh, Christopher Matheson, I'm a disabled veteran. I work for the city of Tennessee as a disabled veteran outreach specialist. Basically, I find employment for vets that don't have a job and try to find housing for homeless vets that do not have housing. Been here about three months. Uh, Simmons, I like to also add, he helps put coins in parking meters part time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name. Uh, Ashley and Hillary, as you both can probably tell, Joel Simmons there is our resident uh, joker in here. He keeps the, the meetings fun and lively. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, do you have any questions for any of our members before we move on? Oh, I am so sorry. You were hidden behind everyone and I did not see you. No worries. My name is Aquila Maxwell. I'm Director of Operations at Paso Area Transit. I'm also an ADA coordinator at here. Um, um, I think I've been on Cody. That's been here, almost a year. Can't remember, but um, I have to be a part of this team. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay. So um, the remainder of membership, <laughs> membership committee does need to meet soon um, to discuss holding interviews not only for potential nominees but also for the officer candidates. I do still need people to step up to be on the ballot for secretary. Um, member Logan Black has also tendered his resignation from his interim term, which ends on June 30th, 2023. So we will also need to fill that spot as well as two additional ones that are not filled at the moment. This is Cook. Um, I just wanted to say briefly about the bylaws. Please don't think bylaws are sitting idle someplace. Nisha has been in communication with the law department. Law department has let us know that Robert's rules of order have been updated. And so there may be some pretty good changes that we can make to the bylaws that would make it easier to host meetings lower the number for quorum and things like that. So um, it's just been a matter of our not having time all at the same time, the three of us, to go through the annotated discussion about that. But that's in the hopper, so it's going on behind the scenes, even though by us committee has the best. Thank you. Transportation. We actually did not have quorum, so we did not meet. Oh, that's right. Nobody showed up. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Strategic plan reports, livability. First of all, I would like to thank Kanya for staying at home today. She takes her job as chair of the livability committee so seriously that she had an ultra high temperature. Um, and was still planning on coming to this meeting. I asked her very kindly to please stay home and take care of herself and also by doing so to take care of all of us so we didn't get it. Um, Lo, would you like to go over that or would you like me to? Um, I can. Perfect. <laughs> um, so we did meet and we did talk about the Chamber of Commerce last week. Misha has given to everybody because um, we had worked on this back in <coughs> February, I believe, and then it kind of got sidelined by some other stuff. And so um, we are trying to get this going. Um, I'm not sure if Misha did contact the team to make sure more and longer is still our main contact. I have not had time to do that quite yet. Uh, so we're not ready for that part yet. But um, if you want to read through, or I can read it if you'd like, because um, we have been working on this uh, since before I was on livability. But this is to go with the accessibility checklist um, that we have also just finished up and hopefully will be actively um, pursuing getting some of those done within the next couple months. Um, I think Misha was going to possibly 
have another sign-up sheet for that, um, but I don't know if that has happened. Um, we did update the verbiage on the email blast to include um, the percentage of metropolitan Knoxville area residents with at least one disability, which is the most updated if you look at five is 13.5%. Because um, that's, we feel that with the exact numbers, places are gonna take notice more often than if you just say, you know, this group with a disability. So, and disability can cover so many different things as we all know. Um, anything else, Nisha, really? Um, as far as the chamber blast, and I'm sure you all can understand this, that is still on the copier at work. I brought the Facebook signups and the location, and the other one is unfortunately on the copier. But if everybody will speak to me before you leave today, I can pull it up on the laptop and go ahead and notate when you would like to do that. Um, otherwise, I can also send that out via email and hopefully in a shared document so everybody can update it in real time. Um, for the chamber blast, if everyone will pause for a moment, go ahead and read through it. In order to have this approved by the full Cody body, if everyone likes it in the format that you see it here, we will need someone to make a motion and somebody to second that motion. Anybody still need more time to read? Can someone read it? Aloud. I can read it aloud. Unless you want to know. No, I'm not sure. Why not? <laughs> Ask yourself if you could afford everyone the opportunity to benefit from your business and services, would you? What if you were missing out on 13.5% number? 13.5% number of sales. That sounds weird when I say it. If you're missing out on 13.5% number of sales. During the 2018 census, it was reported that 13.5% of Knoxville metropolitan area residents reported at least one disability, and that number is growing every day. What if you could be part of a bigger move, a movement bigger than yourself, such as striving to become one of the largest disability-friendly cities in the country? Would you participate? If you answered yes to the call, then <clears throat> the Knoxville Mayor's Council on Disability Issues, Cody, wants to speak to you. By participating in a short voluntary Cody accessibility checklist, you'll gain helpful information you may not have thought of that can help you attract additional consumers you are not reaching. When a business or establishment successfully completes the Disability Friendly Accessibility Standards Checklist, they will receive a window claim that reads, this business is disability friendly, and be listed in the city of Knoxville's Cody list. So what are you waiting for? Join us in the efforts in transforming our community into the most disability friendly city in the country. For more information, you can visit Cody website at www.knoxvilletennessee.gov forward slash Cody or contact Misha Zubank. Uh, yeah, and all that. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Maddie, um, I don't want to reword that for second sentence. It just sounds. Maybe 13.5% of sales in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that number needs to come out. Carter here. I appreciate your reading that because it's very difficult me, for me to even read this plant. Mm -hmm. uh, very slow. And thank you, Jessica, for asking for it to be read out loud. Thank you. Thanks. Monica, do you know something? 
<laughs> I'm just giving some signs to the interpreter, that's all. She's going to give you signs. I know what signs. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it seems it like we've got... Later. <laughs> later, I'll show you those. <laughs> This is Zubac. It seems that we have the addendum to cross out number and have uh, that second sentence of the first paragraph simply read, what if you are missing out on 13.5% of cells? Is there anybody that would like to make a motion to accept it with the addendum? Do you want to make a motion to accept it with the addendum? I'll second it. I was waiting for somebody to do something. But... <laughs> That was a good job. This is fine work. So, is this written in stone? This is what. What if the motion passes? What? I was just going to make a suggestion. And okay. Make a suggestion. Maybe something, something about the spending power of people with disabilities, because they have a lot of spending power. If that's applicable, if not, forget I said it. Oh, I don't know. I was just making a suggestion. I mean, it doesn't. I think people respond to money a lot as opposed to. I'm, I'm not a numbers person. I, I, I want to see a figure. 13.5% doesn't mean anything to me. All right, so apparently I need to call for a discussion and then we go. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so. <laughs> This topic is now open for discussion. Uh, anybody else like to interject on that concept? Or this is Carter, and the only thing I'll say about that is what Stacy stated is exactly right. Uh, they see nothing but dollar and cent. I know that from uh, working where I do and dealing with what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently, I passed uh, Section 508 with evaluator. And I have my certification, so of course we're reaching out because that determines whether or not your website is accessible uh, to people with disabilities, not just vision. It's anybody that's keyboard using the keyboard. And uh, the first thing I hear from people is, I had someone say to me, well, how many people with disabilities actually use a computer? Mm -hmm. And then I, everything else has been, what's the bottom line dollar? Mm -hmm. So it's... You know, it, I have no uh, no opinion one way or the other, whether you want to reform that. I'm just saying she's right on the dollar. Yep. If you want anybody to do anything, you've got to do with dollar sign up there. Sherman, sure. What, what dollar amount are we attached to? Spangler, I think, I want to say it's 24, 27 million dollars that people with disabilities have in spending power. I don't quote me on that. I'm sure somebody can do it. Now it's just soon. I don't I don't know. I never look at that one. That's just a figure that's sticking in my head for some reason. It could be totally wrong. It's cooked. What if we combine the number of individuals with disabilities and seniors and some oh, no, this is a message. They on fire. Time to change classes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No barriers for use of care customers. Your is not authorized person. Lord is not prepared on these premises. Please avoid the voice of the time matter. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking, uh, given some of the stats with AARP, I've seen things that say one in three people has a person with a disability in their family. Mm -hmm. However, you wish to word that. Seniors are where the buying power is in this country, the baby boomers. Um, so, if we could find the number of people with disabilities and seniors and their buying power, that may be worth um, putting that percentage in there. But now, where do we find that number? Landfill here, sorry. I'm throwing out my business hat right now. Uh, if I were reading this, 13.5% speaks to me in dollars when I'm looking at my business, okay? Because 
whatever number you throw out there, it needs to be a hundred thousand, it could be a million, it could be two million, a hundred million, doesn't matter. The only thing I care about is what's my version of that. Mm -hmm. So the 13.5% speaks to my version of that, and the rest of it actually doesn't matter. So in a sense, the percentage does provide a number mm -hmm. to me as the business person. Food for thought. This is Bangalore. Um, I'm just Google, and y'all are going to die. Uh, people with disabilities have nearly half a trillion dollars in disposable income. This is Zubac. Uh, Matheson is actually currently trying to find the 2018 numbers for what was spent within the city of Knoxville to coincide with the 2018 census mm -hmm. that we quoted for the 13.5%. Same as here. When I'm reading this, our target audience is businesses, am I correct? Mm -hmm. I, I'm always with the KISS rule, and uh, I, 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 that, that, that's our target market. Let's, let's keep it simple. I think any business needs to say, hey, I need to increase your sales 13.5%. What the buying power is, that's just my opinion. But I feel like can add any more. I mean, I just, I, I understand where you're going, Stacey, and I totally get it if we're just talking to the individuals. But if it's businesses, quick, concise, to the point, uh, that's just my opinion. So, thanks, everybody. This has been a great uh, conversation and debate. So, we could go a couple different ways about it. We could motion to just Accept this the way it is with striking out the word number in the second, or we can motion to push it off, rewrite it, and then vote on it again next month. So, Cook. What does pe what do people think about simply taking out sentence two? Ask yourself, if you could afford everyone the opportunity to benefit from your business and services, would you? During the 2018 census, it was reported that 13.5% of KMA residents reported at least one disability, and the number is growing every day. I like your thinking on that. The one thing I would say in support of sentence number two is it asks a very specific question that your brain is going to want to answer. And then it's followed up with that statistic. So I would be inclined to leave sentence. Okay. Uh, Barbara here, I'm going to move that we accept it with that agenda. The deal on the Second. But we didn't we have a motion and a second earlier, so... We did, but then we opened it up for discussion, they, so we had a review. Uh, same motion, same second. Same motion, same second. Different second. Excuse <laughs> 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 me. Yeah. Uh, anybody in dissent? Yeah, let's roll call it. In fact, I've got it pulled up right here. Alexander, uh, a, yay or nay? Yay. To accept, correct? Correct. Okay. Ajinkya? Yeah. Barber? Yeah. Well, you motioned, yeah. so. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooks? Yeah. Carter? Yes. Childress? Yes. Landfather? Yes. Lowe? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Shimon Orr? Yes. Simmons? Yes. Spangler? Yes. Villanueva? Yes. Welch? Yes. Motion unanimously passes. Yeah. We need. Okay, the boss just told me she wanted to do something. So. <laughs> All right, rather than asking everybody to get up and come to me before you leave the meeting about the accessibility surveys, um, I do have this pulled up with the prior ones that have been uh, added to it. So I will say your name what I do have you already down for, and then either ask for one or two dates 
based upon, or none, if you put both of them in there, based upon what I have. Um, Alexander, I would like two dates for you that you can join Livability to do an accessibility survey. Virginia? Anytime in 2023. Um, in fact, we can go out to June 2024 if you want. June 30th. Oh, I just need the month. Of June and August. June and August. Thank you so much. Uh, Ashley and Hillary, I'm going to get with you separately um, sometime after the meeting next week, if that's okay. That way it gives you a little bit of time and we can discuss what all that entails. Barbara, I have you down for July of 2023. May I have one more day? October. October sounds perfect. Nancy Carter? Uh, I can do July or uh, September. Okay. I'm going to put you down for July of 2023 and September of 2023. Childress, I have you down for August and December of 2023. Um, Landfather? No. Uh, August. Thank you. And uh, October. All right. Uh, Mabby. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Shimon Orr, I have you down for August of 2023. I need one more date, please. Mm. Okay, so um, I'm used to be at August 2023 party down, but is there another month to suggest it's open or available? I think as long as members are doing this, that it does not matter whether we do too many or too few in one single month. It's the overall that we're going for. Um, October is what I think. Okay, perfect. Simmons, I have you down for May and June of this year. Okay. Spangler, I have you down for November and July of this year. And Villanueva, I have you down for June and October of this year. Um, if you all want to change any of those dates, please let me know. And Welch, I have you for May of, of this year as well. May I have one additional date? July. Perfect. Now I need to press save before all this goes bye bye. Yes, Joel. Um, it all have. You're, this is to join livability to do a survey like in business and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what about the ones that we've already done? Do you have those down? The ones that have already been completed? I know that you have done quite a few of them, and we I mean, see I don't really do it. I'm always up for beverages. And <laughs> we have had, I believe, four. Yeah, four done so far. And I think you helped on two of those. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So me, me, Karen did one, and then me and uh, Hank. Uh, it was Hank. Hank. Yeah, yeah. You were ahead of the curve. If I could give you a prize, I would. Oh, wait, you've got candy. Yeah. <laughs> That's no Yost, though. You know. I'm, I'm Yost, hey, all I'm saying is he had to have somebody get in touch with him and say, Can you please bring this candy Yost, from the Yost, I'll get your number. <laughs> change one of those? No, I just didn't hear the second one. Okay. Thank you. If anybody at any time wants to change one of their dates, please just let me know. I do not mind. Spangler? Um, is this the sign-up sheet for suggestions for where we can go do the accessibility surveys, or is this 
a sign-up sheet for potential locations for us to have a coding meeting for? Potential locations for coding meetings. I know that you all filled this out beforehand, um, but we got a lot of great stuff on there, and I figured I might as well bring it, pass it around again, because businesses come, businesses go. We've got new members on with us, and so we might have some additional locations suggested. Yes, all right, we're going to move on to universal design. Huckleberry. Yeah, he's too busy talking about his camp. He's assisting me. Joe, whenever you're ready, No. Wait, we need to go to universal design. Okay. Uh, I'm the chair of universal design, and unlike. Uh, Telling you the, the chair of livability, we don't have the gravity and seriousness to go figure in that. But we did get enough people to meet yesterday. So what do we know when we, we address the, uh, we really haven't done anything since they presented the stuff to the mayor on visibility type C. But what we're looking at is for the good people here, with universal design, are you familiar, anybody familiar with what universal design is? Okay, we're, we're trying to get in touch with builders uh, to, to see you know, what, what the process would be. I've been to a few uh, home builders associations and just gone up and talked to random builders. And we're not going to educate them. They know what universal design is. What we're faced with is most builders are selling everything they build. And we've already talked knowledge is what moves people. But what we talked about yesterday was reaching out to builders and possibly even real estate agents to see what they're seeing in the market. What are, what are their requests from, 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 from their consumers? Um, Mr. Children works in Lowe's, so he's going to speak with some of the builders that come there. I have a friend who's worked at Pro Contractors Desk and just recently retired from, uh, from Lowe's working with builders. As a matter of fact, I called him today. And he's playing golf with some people that are building a lot. They call them tiny houses, but they actually fall under this uh, uh, accessory dwelling units. So we're kind of looking at that point. Um, it's, it's really a pick. There's not a lot of affordable housing in Knoxville. Our median, uh, median uh, cost of a house is what, $360,000? So if you're looking for affordable, accessible housing, well, now you've really pushed it to. So right now, for until our next meeting, we're going to try to see if we can get in touch with some builders and possibly some realtors and see if they're hearing any, any, any lack of in the market so that we can proceed from there on how we want to address the issue with the, with the builders and stuff in line with that stuff, this is my phone. Uh, you, you may know, what's the county doing? Is there any opportunity there for us to work um, together? Um, since I don't, I don't pay close enough attention to the county. Yeah, no way, just not the <laughs> um, but I can tell you that um, it is in the works for there's. It's been created a city county joint office on housing stability. So that's going to have a primary focus on homelessness. Um, in a legislative meeting yesterday, Council Member Lauren Ryder asked our department specifically um, about the tiny homes concept. She gave an example of the Dungeon cottages in um, Savannah, Georgia. Very interesting concept. Um, so this is something that, that is on the minds of, of Council and mayor as well as those departments and staff who are focused on the housing so i have a meeting on the 17th with some county folks and if you don't mind let me post that question to them and then i'll try my best to remember to get that report back at the next meeting so again that was another thing we discussed as a part of buildings that are being built um, Best that I can tell. Most of them stay at three stories because they go four and they got to put an elevator in. And that's because they don't want to incur. So it seems that through our research, the average apartment units are about 70. 
So our seven, let's keep it even number, 75. So that's 25 apartments on each floor. We've discussed, well, if you have 25 parking spaces, X amount have to be designated. I know everybody hates the word, but that's what's out there. Handicap accessible. Only through codes enforcement, I think we can get it done, but it would be nice if of those 25 that are on that bottom level, a certain percentage be made accessible. And uh, I have friends that are in manual chairs. Oddly enough, a manual chair has a wider wheelbase than my power chair does. But most of them, when they, they're called accessible, you can get through the front door. They can't use the, the, the bathrooms, the showers. I mean, and then a lot of them are older apartments that are actually have the rent reduced enough where people <coughs> that are living on the limited incomes can, can, can afford them. Knoxville led the country in rent increase over the last year. I think it's like 11%. If you can buy an apartment for less than $1,200, uh, then, then, then it's accessible. So it, it's a mess, and we're kind of frustrated on what power and ability we have as this community to do. All we can do is throw stuff out there and hope, hope something sticks with somebody, but in reality, you look at the teeth we have for something like that, and I think, you know, we, we're dumb to donuts without without getting somebody involved in and doing, doing some of the stuff that goes. Agreed. So, Maddie, I have direct contact with a real estate agent, a real estate firm, and the builder are all the same thing. So I can reach out to them if you like. Yeah, I'll give you my, uh, my, my cell phone number if you like to. Uh, you can give me a shout, we can discuss it. Uh, so, my comment on all this is our firm is working on a lot of those new buildings, city sovereign and you know, uh, 200 block of gay, um, what, Lone Tree Pass, and the ones by the ballpark, and the build, not the builders, but the developers, it's code. What does code say I need to do? That's what I'm doing. And as, an, as the architects, we don't have, all we can do is say, well, you know, but ultimately it's their dime, it's their money. Uh, but I can tell you, those, those are, they're meeting code. This is Cook. Why do I seem to have a recollection of a meeting, an executive committee meeting with the mayor, where we discuss the number of floors and that, that you know, elevator requirements in two-story multifamily housing would be great. Did, am I dreaming that, Alicia? So maybe, maybe we just need to circle back on that. What would it take? We know there's a huge housing shortage, way expensive. What's available is not accessible. Fair Housing Act does require all ground floor units to meet minimal accessibility requirements, but that's minimum. <coughs> so, and, then, and then whatever supply parking is going to also fall into that ratio. And it's a, it's a very defined ratio. Mm -hmm. you know, for this number, you need one. For this number, you need two. For this mm -hmm. number, you need, you need a van access. You know, Live accessible all of that. And that's where they're at. They're with code. So, you know, it's not the best news, but. This is the thing. Who's in charge of code? Who writes that stuff? Who do you got to get to change that up? Well, so there's the IBC, which is the International Building Code, which is what uh, Knoxville follows, Knox County follows. And then the city slash county can do their own ordinances, which fall on top of the code, and that's a city council mayor thing, you know, and the mayor's focus because of prior commitments is on missing middle ground. That's, that's, that's where her focus is. Uh, through our conversations, she was very upfront about that. This, this is an issue. She sees it. Right now, she's focused on missing middle. So that's that, that middle housing that Really, this would fall into, but it's like another layer on top of it. Because right? uh, that's exactly the conversation we have, the executive committee, and the mayor, and the vice mayor, we have this conversation uh, to try and get her to legislate on it. Uh, and basically, that's not going to happen right now because of prior promises, which makes sense. Uh, 
receptive to our data and information uh, concerning it. I think we do have some advocates on the vice mayoral staff and down. So we just got to keep put pressure on. Just keep put pressure on. It's not going to happen because that's politics and that's business and that's all that other fun stuff. This is Zubak. Overall, uh, when we spoke to the higher ups, it was a very positive discussion. And although there may not be code changes at this moment, um, it seemed like everybody was excited to implement what they could <coughs> at this time. Sure, sure. Yeah, of course it's going to be good to you know, meet with. Yeah, that's great because it is. It's good, it's equitable, it's right, you feel good about it. All the measures. Code on Always practice. Yeah. <laughs> But also, with that said, another thing we discussed with the interest rates going up a little bit, we might be rethinking exactly, well, oh, wait a second, you know, where, you know what, what can we be building differently when we got, got, a, new, got a new market? There's, when the interest rates you can get a house for, for 1 to 2% interest, they're selling everything they built. There might be a window of opportunity here with the interest rates up a little bit where somebody looks for another niche in the market. I'll tell you from the, and you'll probably find the same data from your friend, the realtor. Someone works for one of the more prominent realtors in town, and they're still selling stuff like oh, yeah. hotcakes, and it doesn't matter. Right? Well, that's still, yeah, that's still a good interest rate. Right? Mm -hmm. There's not two interest for now. Right. Yeah, if you're ready to buy a house. I mean, good thing is we are seeing some price decrease. I mean, that, from our standpoint, all we can do is keep coming up with a different way to, 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 to make this, keep putting it out there. Yeah. And then hopefully we will hit somebody that's not a mega builder. They're not, they're not selling everything they go to like, hey, wait a second, I see an opportunity here. And, because uh, there is that opportunity to have, to have it made. But talking to the people that are selling everything they're building is a waste of time. I'll give Warren Buffett a call. <laughs> what else you guys have? You, you all have for um, universal design? That's it. We're done. That's it. You're done. It's done. It's done. New business. New show. I've got some. City of Knoxville will be holding a neighborhood resource fair on Saturday, August 12th, 2023 at the Jacobs Building in Shelhowie Park, um, which is located at 3301 East Magnolia Avenue. The event will be from 8 a.m. until 12 p.m. And I am looking for volunteers to help staff the table. Are there any takers? What, what was the time again? Way too early in the morning till about lunchtime, <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning till noon. <laughs> what day? Saturday. Saturday, August 12th. August? August. Outside? <laughs> <laughs> it's, in, it's in the Jacobs building. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll like volunteer. Childress would like volunteer. Thank you, Childress. So for Spangler. Thank you, Spangler. As long as it's inside. We're all right. right. right inside. And I believe those are all the volunteers that I actually need for this. I really appreciate you both, and I will get in contact with you um, privately with more information as I get additional information. Is that the big, the neighborhood conference you got? Is it the Yes and no. Um, it's the other half of it. They have broken it up into two. Um, they now have the award ceremony, which has already gone on. Um, and then they're having the Neighborhood Resource Fair, which is the part that's going to be August 12th that we will be at. Um, this is going to allow more people to attend the Resource Fair. Um, it will, of course, cut down on those that simply come just to go to the award ceremony luncheon and actually don't stick around. And then it makes the award ceremony a little bit more special for those who get the, the awards um, because it is such a uh, a, a more limited group. 
So I might need to let me run it by my supervisor if you like me to participate in those things. Okay. Because I've got to, you know. Um, they, the invites have not been sent out to non-city of Knoxville yet. However, um, what I can do, and I would super appreciate an email, I can speak to the person who I reserved our table with. And if your supervisor would like you to do a table, I can request that we get one side by side. Perfect. I don't know if that will happen, but I can request it. I think Mr. Alexander is going to have a table at an event this Friday. You want to share with the group about that? And buy uh, them, huh? Yeah, the Disability Resource Center is also going to have a resource event on Market Square. And they're going to have several vendors there. Uh, I'll be there with the table, including uh, our programs. Um, I believe it's from 9.30 to 3 p.m. this Friday in Market Square. Mm -hmm. All right, and you all should have all gotten an email um, that I forwarded from Catherine with DRC that has all of the information in it. Simon, Chair, I'll be helping man the table at DRC <coughs> as well. So come on down. In three, there's a certain uh, proprietor there on Market Square that opens up at three with wonderful <laughs> opportunities. To, to sit and share what we've gone through at a very reasonable price for three days. Always got angle. Huh? Always got angle. But just a history reason. To be fair, it's always the same angle. <laughs> it is always. <laughs> huh? Simmons, I, I, I might join you. <laughs> All right. Any other new business? Nope. Okay, we're going to move on to announcements and public. And I am going to call out Miss Maxwell to announce what we are doing at the end of this meeting. Okay. Uh, I have a representative with uh, CAT and we're going to do a, a tour of the facility. Other announcements? Mm -hmm. All right, so I got a little anecdotal story for public forum, and it's directly related to kind of Cause. So myself, disabled vet, disabled vet, right? Um, dealing with the VA, and this just goes to show how politics infiltrates everything. I put in to have my disability increased uh, because of like I wake up, my arms are numb, and this, that, and the other, so other stuff. Like that. And so it goes through this whole process. <laughs> Get a little VA, and it comes back. I went up from seventy percent to eighty percent for five days. Then back down to 70%. <laughs> they increased certain things, but decreased other things to keep me at 70%. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> then I get a call from my father, who's a Vietnam vet, who finally, just finally got his 30% 30, 30 disability. Right? Yeah, exactly. And now they're trying to take it away from them all together. So we're writing letters and doing all this. And I'm like, what is going on? Then I'm paying attention to the news. Well, what's going on in the news right now? They're slashing veterans' budgets. They're doing all this nonsense with budgets. And I'm like, ah, I see what's happening. OK. So it's just a sad reality that part of this community has to deal with, especially on the veteran side with the aid funding. Um, it's just frustrating. Not that we're going to do anything about them, obviously. It's just an anecdotal story. It's there. Sure, sure. That just irritates me. Yeah. Tie this crap into his guts. It's political events and everything. We got people out there. They, that's a, that 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 chaps me to something different. And uh, I actually, I, I just hate that you guys have to deal with all that, considering the budget we have with DOD. And uh, yeah, I can go forever on that one, but you got all my empathy. I promise. You. Well, appreciate that, Joel. You know, my perspective is I stay grateful for what I do get. Uh, and I'll just keep that outlook on it because that's just the way it is. So, anyway, anything else for public forum announcements? No. All right. What you got? What you got? Yeah. 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 So, if you were our meeting, this is Barbara. Um, last time we discussed the, excuse me, the AARP 
uh, community grant program and if that was a thing we wanted to pursue as a body and these AARP community challenge grants to remind you uh, great, it's a grant program to make communities more livable for people of all ages with tangible improvements that jumpstart long-term change. And there's, um, you, have, you all have a copy of the minutes from last month, so you can read in more detail uh, about the three different types of grants. There's flagship grants, capacity building micro grants, and demonstration grants. And what we said at the last meeting was we were going to take a month to think these things over and potentially come back to today with ideas or suggestions and just to remind you applications open uh january or february ish um so we would need to be beginning to talk about these things now so we'd be ready for that so opening that up for discussion this is cook i will tell you that i am um i'm a volunteer with the arp i've been on their east Tennessee volunteer leadership team for a few years and I have the distinct privilege of reading about 40 of the community challenge grant applications that came in this year. Amazing what some of the ideas are and, um, and even just some of the, the way they are building community uh, across the country. It's really the, and these were just for the ones that were applications in the state of Tennessee. And I think I was told that this year was a record year with 140 something applications. Mm -hmm. So words getting out, it's getting you know more known and more competitive. Um, I think it'd be super neat to do. Um, but as a sidebar, how many of you have heard me say that the city of Knoxville is designated as an age-friendly network city? So some of you, some of you better around long enough to hear me talk about that. Well, we were designated by the World Health Organization in 2018, I want to say, and um, since then, we, we got a kind of a slow start, then we had the pandemic, we come out of the pandemic, um, we have new mayoral staff, lots of the staff that had been previously involved have moved on or changed, so we are in the process now um, to convene the steering committee of that body so you will begin to hear more and more about that. In fact, your strategic plan groups, livability and universal design are direct results of our designation as an age friendly network city. So I'm hopeful that by this time next year, you will see a whole lot more regular information about our age friendly network activities. And there may be something also exciting about to happen on the county side that will just have to stay right here right now and that's all i can say until they have a couple of moments to work a few things through so it's a good step well here's my barbara here I have a question which is is there a is there a sort of a mechanism this would be a question for stephanie you should probably is there a mechanism for making kind of a a limited subcommittee to discuss this issue? Yes. Special call committees um, can definitely happen. Uh, well, applications begin at the beginning of the year. Um, I think this year applications begin January 18th, something like that. They opened and they're open for like a month, mm -hmm. something like that. It seems like. Seems like we got them mid April, yeah, end of April, had two weeks to review all of them. I literally bring those applications. Man, I mean, I was really impressed with some of them. Yeah, and what's interesting is there's a ton of information on the website where you can read, you can see video of projects, you can see like concrete examples. And so, my recommendation, I think, would be to Let's pick three or four people that want to pursue this thing more directly and come up with a sort of an ad hoc subcommittee. I have had my eyes on so many different iterations of bylaws right now. I cannot remember exactly what it says on 
how we are supposed to make that happen. However, we can definitely do that. Um, what I will ask is one of our brand new members that I know has a copy of bylaws on them right now. May I please borrow it? I am having trouble accessing the internet. Do you want to? Yeah, I would love that. Thank you, Stephanie. I have my hotspot pulled up on my phone for the laptop, but it has decided it's no longer working today. It is off work. <laughs> She's got it right here. Yes. Special committees, as appropriate, will be formed by Cody. Each committee shall elect a chairperson at the annual retreat or at appropriate meeting following the retreat. No one member shall serve as chair for more than one standing or special committee. Every committee must consist of at least three people. So, three people, and somebody wants to wear the hat chair, <coughs> and you can call it AARP Community Challenge Grant Committee, or whatever you want to call it. There's no vote required for that. I'm sorry? There's no vote required for that. Mm -hmm. We just decided. Okay. Mm -hmm. there you go. Thank you. Sir. Are there, uh, by a show of hands, is there anybody that would like to be on a specially called committee for the Cody Grant uh, AARP Challenge 2024? I've got Barber, Villanueva, uh, Ajinkya, and hold on, Barber, Villanueva, Ajinkya, and Welch. <laughs> Out of those four, please raise your hand if you would like or are willing to be considered as chair. Okay, we've got Welch and Barber that are both chairs of committee, which would leave Villanueva and Ajinkya. Ajinkya is a brand new member. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get her to put her name in the hat for secretary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Bill Nueva is going to be our chair of that committee. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And uh, I will, it will be next week. I'm out of hours um, in two minutes. But for the week, um, but I will send out an email to uh, the four of you. I will connect everybody, try to set up um, an initial Zoom meeting for everybody to meet, and then we can discuss how to proceed going forward within that group. Senator, I'd like to make a motion we adjourn so she still get paid. <laughs> Second. All right. Motion carried.